So we're in John chapter 10. What, what's happening in this passage is Jesus is walking in the temple in Jerusalem. And I'm going to provide, uh, provide a little background information and some of the significance of what's going on here. Um, but what happens a lot of times is we're 2,000 years away from most of these events that we read about, if not more, um, depending on how far back you go into the Old Testament. Um, and so what happens is we're in a very different culture. Um, we think of different things um, when we read words than perhaps the original audience would have thought about. Uh, it's written in a different language and then translated to us. Um, and so what happens is um, if, we don't, if we don't understand the historical context behind some of the things that we're reading, we, I mean, we can understand it. We get what's going on. We understand the dialogue um, because the, the meaning behind the words have been preserved. But we don't understand all the significance behind it. Amen. Um, so if someone says, you know, never forget, well, that can mean a lot of things. It could be a wife reminding her husband about her anniversary or her birthday, right? But if you stand on the side of 9-11, on 9-11, and say never forget, there's a lot of weight behind that, right? There's a lot of significance behind that. If a soldier says it who fought in Iraq or Afghanistan says it, if, if a, someone who lost a loved one on 9-11 says it, right? Very different breadth of, of impact comes with that. Right, so um, if you read something in the Bible and it seems like people are overreacting, um, it's because we're missing something there, right? Something else is it, deeper is happening, or there's some sort of um, there's some sort something that comes along with some of these words. They're loaded with meaning. They're loaded with impact and historical and cultural and religious and spiritual significance. And so in order to truly understand like the full impact of what's being said in this passage, we have to go back a couple hundred years just to get a good sense of what's happening and why this means so much. Um, and so we're going to do a little bit of that today. So we're going to hop in the DeLorean and go back a couple hundred years back from when Jesus was, was walking to a little bit earlier. And so once I, so I'll read the passage quickly. So we get an understanding of, okay, what's going on here? And then we're going to go back and look at the context for a minute, right? So if you are like history, you're history buff or historian, you, you might get some, some kicks and giggles out of this. If not, just hang on, we're getting somewhere. Um, and then we'll, we'll, I'll give you some of the information based on why this is so significant, why this is so important. And then we're going to look at the passage again with new eyes and see why these people are acting the way that they're acting, okay? So... In, in John chapter 10, verse number 22, I'm going to read to, to verse number 33. And you can remain seated. seated. Um, John 10, 22 to 33. And it was at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But do you believe not, because you are not of my sheep? <clears throat> As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. And my, uh, and my Father... I and my father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Now, again, they're trying to stone him. So we're getting a little bit of uh, something that happened before. So if you don't know what stoning is, it's a little different than we think about now in most college campuses. But stoning is when you circle around somebody and you throw rocks at them until they die. Now, this sounds fun, um, but it's actually a pretty gruesome way to die. So they took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, uh, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Okay, so we get a little bit of, just not having any of the background, we get a little bit of understanding that the Jews love God, 
this guy is saying he's God. That's what they're understanding when he says it. And they don't like that because God is not human. And this guy's a human. He's a, he's a carpenter or a craftsman. The idea behind Jesus being a carpenter is not necessarily that he only, you know, built A-frame houses or something, right? The idea behind a carpenter of the first century is that they were like general construction workers. They could do a lot of different stuff. And during this time period, it's most likely that Jesus was more of like a stone builder, right? And it's very likely that he worked on the temple that he's actually in right now, built some of the stones. So for roughly 30 years, he was not, a, he was not acting as a prophet or a, a, an itinerant preacher or a Messiah to them. He was, a, he was a construction worker. So when he starts saying things like, I'm God, they don't appreciate that very much because they're like, you work for Billy Bob's lumber yard um, and there's no way that you're Messiah because we saw you hefting around a bunch of stones, right? And putting them in the place in the temple. So they're getting upset about this. So let's, let's open this up a little bit more. So this is happening roughly in the late 20s AD. Now that doesn't necessarily add a lot to it, but just to get a sense of where we are here in the timeline. Roughly late 20s AD. Jesus is early on in his ministry. He just got done healing a blind man. Caught a lot of flack for that because he did it on the Sabbath, which we'll get into that a little bit more. But a couple hundred years before that, in 167 BC, now the Jews right now in, in the late 20s AD, they're under Roman rule, right? So if you, you hear about the stories of Pilate, right? Washing his hands and letting Jesus go to be crucified. The Jews weren't allowed to have a death penalty because they were under Roman rule. So they were, the Romans were the big dogs and they had to basically live according to their culture, but only as so much as the Romans would allow them to. And so they're under Roman rule. And this is not new for the Jews. They've been under a lot of Roman rule. They were taken captive by Babylon, Assyria. They were attacked by um, Syria. Uh, they were attacked by the Philistines, the Canaanites, the Amorites, a whole bunch of different ites, right? Israel's constantly under siege. One reason is because they insist on being different than everyone else. But number two is they're in, a, they're in an area, a land right now, which is also being fought over currently um, with Palestine and Israel currently fighting over that land right now. It's not a new thing. It's been going on for a while now. So Israel's in an area that other people like to have. And so they don't like that Israel's there. So 167 BC. So this is roughly a couple hundred years before Jesus is having this conversation. Um, Syria was controlling Israel. So Israel again was under some sort of bondage. All right. They had to follow their rules. So the leader of Syria, his name was Antiochus Epiphanes, or Antiochus Epiphanes, some call him. Now, this was not a good guy. So he was kind of an early type of what we think of when we think of the Antichrist, right? When the Bible talks about the Antichrist coming, and all, right, you've seen the Tim LaHaye and Jerry B. Jenkins movies, right? All the Left Behind movies, and you've read the books and all that stuff. So I won't get too much into that. Um, but Antiochus Epiphanes was not a good dude. So he called himself God in the flesh, so Epiphanes, he called himself the, the human version of God or a God. Now, if you know the Jewish people, they're not a big fan of that either. He went into their temple and he sacrificed a pig on an altar in their temple. Again, Jews didn't like pigs. They thought they were unclean. Um, they thought they, they desecrated any place they were. They made it, they made it unclean, right? Like a four-year-old. They're gonna make every place a mess wherever they go. So the pigs, they were not allowed to eat bacon. Life maybe not worth living there. I'll leave it up to you. Um, but not allowed to eat bacon, no ham. Pizza must have been terrible. But he sacrificed a pig. They also did not like that. Um, said he was God, sacrificed a pig, desecrated the temple. So a guy named Judas Maccabeus, right? If you've heard of the Maccabees, perhaps, if you're a history nerd, okay? Judas Maccabeus said, yeah, we're not going to stand for that. So he started a revolt. They called him Judas the Hammer. Right? Probably not a very subtle guy. Um, I think I know the type, um, but a guy who was probably contentious and not going to lay down for somebody sacrificing a pig on God's altar. So in 167, he, that, he did that, Antiochus Epiphanes. Judas Maccabeus said, yeah, we're not going to stand for that, and they, he, he, they revolted. The Jewish people revolted. So two years later in 165, they, just, they beat Syria. They took back the altar. And then they basically rebuilt things and rededicated it to God. 
So 165, rededicated the temple to God, cleansed it, got rid of all the pig juice, all the pig stuff, right? Cleaned everything up and said, all right, this is God's holy place again. Now for the Jews, places and things are very, very important. They hold a lot of symbolism, okay? So they cleaned the temple and they rededicated. And this was a very big deal in Jewish history. So when they hear this, this is like a second exodus for them, right? You remember when God delivered people, uh, the people of Israel from, uh, from Egypt, and he, he cracked open the Red Sea through Moses, God's people walked through, and it crashed back down on the Egyptian army when they tried to get them. Just a, a, a big demonstrative display of God's mercy, protection, and provision for his people. <coughs> So this was considered a big win for God's people. They're constantly under oppression. They're constantly being attacked. And Judas Maccabeus leads uh, Israel to a victory, and they rededicate the temple. So every year during this same time, which was in mid-December, they had what's called the Feast of Dedication, which is where Jesus is at in the temple in Jerusalem at the new temple that had been rebuilt by Herod, um, over the past several decades from, I think it was like 20 BC to like 6 AD, something like that. Herod had been rebuilding the, the temple in Jerusalem to kind of gain the favor of, of the Jews so they wouldn't revolt against the Romans. There's a whole lot of political stuff going on, but I'll spare you the politics. But essentially, Jesus is in Jerusalem, in the temple, at the time in the eight day festival when the Jews were celebrating the rededication of that temple to God from pagan rule and from outside oppression. They were celebrating a major victory, like I do every so often when I celebrate Clemson winning the national title, two years out of three. Um, and I'll go back and I rewatch it and I put my jersey on and I embarrass my family for a couple of days and I yell at the TV and I get upset when we fumble even though I know we win. But we have these dedications, right? Um, we do this with our children when they're babies. We, sometimes we have dedication ceremonies where we dedicate them to the Lord. So Jesus, a couple hundred years later, from what many would consider to be the second great exodus of Israel, a huge win over Syrian, a.k.a. pagan rule, where they desecrated God's temple, they insulted God, and they had a man who claimed to be God in the flesh show up. Some of you are connecting some of these dots already claiming to be God in the flesh, <coughs> oppressing God's people. So this is a time when Israel is thinking forward to their Messiah. So every time, so when we think during December, during Christmas, when we gather and we think about uh, the birth of Jesus, we think about uh, during Easter, we think about the resurrection, and we look forward to a time when God will come and reunite with his people, and God will have a, a, um, a physical rule on earth, right? So when we die, we don't just go to heaven and float in the clouds for forever. No, Jesus is coming back. He's going to be a mighty conquering ruler. He's going to conquer earth. He's going to rule it with a, a rod of iron. And uh, we're going to have a new heaven and a new earth. So we're not just up there, whatever, eating cotton candy on the clouds with little naked babies playing harps, right? This is a physical thing that's going to be taking place in the future. This festival, this Feast of Dedication, is currently known as Hanukkah. So if you're confused as to what Hanukkah is, what's the big deal with all the candles, um, and why don't they get presents like we do? Well, don't worry, they do get presents, right? They get eight days of it, so maybe more than us. I haven't counted the actual sum total, but um, the Jews currently have the Feast of Dedication, which is um, what they consider to be Hanukkah. So they have eight days of lighting candles, and um, there's a lot of historical context that I won't dive into because it would take up much of our time, but that's what's happening here. This is a very early Hanukkah celebration. It's the, it's the eight days of Hanukkah. Jesus is in the temple. Um, they wouldn't have necessarily called it Hanukkah. It wouldn't have been celebrated the same way that it is now. Holidays kind of evolve over hundreds of years and solidify into certain traditions and things like that. So um, it looked a little more rudimentary than it would now. But this is the Feast of Dedication when they're celebrating literally God's conquering of a pagan nation that oppressed them. They are currently oppressed by Rome. They are waiting for what? A Messiah, right? What kind of Messiah were they expecting? They were expecting a man, not God in the flesh, a human to come to be a king for them like David and to overthrow Rome just like Judas Maccabeus did 
in 167 BC. Okay, everybody with me so far? I'm throwing a lot of stuff at you. Lots of numbers. We won't do any math, I promise. I'm going to do a lot of generalizing. So I don't want to make you do math on a Sunday. But Jesus is in Solomon's temple. Or, yes, uh, Solomon's porch inside of the temple of Jerusalem. Now, it's a big deal. They just got done remodeling it. They're still remodeling it, right? During Jesus' lifetime, it was an ongoing work. So everyone's thinking, man, this temple is amazing. They just got some refresh. They got some new art up, right? Herod, had, they had just built Solomon's colonnade, which is where Jesus is walking. So it's kind of like an outer court outside of, uh, outside of the temple that is sheltered from the elements. So there's a wall that's around the outside, but when you're inside, you can see the temple, right? So it's kind of like, um, like a fence, like a courtyard area um, with big, beautiful uh, walls and, and uh, stonework. And so Jesus was walking through there. Now keep in mind, this is the Messiah. It's not the Messiah they were expecting or even really the one they wanted at the time, but this is Messiah. He's also claiming to be God in the flesh, sometimes indirectly and sometimes directly, right? When we read the New Testament, okay, let's just clear this up. When we read the New Testament, Jesus claims to be God, okay? So one of three things is happening. So this is what we have to deal with when we read the New Testament. If, we, if we're seeing that Jesus says he's God, there are three things we can accept. Number one, he's telling the truth and Jesus is God in the flesh. Number two, he's not God in the flesh and he's lying. Number three, he thinks he's God in the flesh because he's crazy. So C.S. Lewis, Lewis called this the, he could be your Lord, a liar, or a lunatic, but he can't be all three. If Jesus is not God, he can't be a good person. Right. If Jesus is not God, he can't be a good leader and a good rabbi, but was a little confused. He's either God in the flesh, he's a liar, or he's mentally insane. So those are the three options you have. As a Christian, when we look at the deity of Jesus Christ, and I could spend two hours going through every passage in the New Testament where Jesus claimed to be God, said he was God, and demonstrated it, and multiple times, including here, they tried to kill him for it because they knew exactly what he was saying. There was no confusion here, right, right. okay? So when we approach scripture as a Christian, those are our three options. There's no confusion about whether or not Jesus thought he was God. There's no confusion about whether or not the disciples thought he was God. And there's no confusion about whether the, the, the Jewish leaders, the Sadducees and the Pharisees at the time thought Jesus thought he was God. Everyone thought that Jesus was claiming to be God. There's no question there. If you read the New Testament, it's all over the place. So those are our three options. So I'll let you choose. I won't tell you which one's the right answer, but I'll let you choose. So again, Jesus is walking, and we're not going to, I'm finishing up here in the next 10 minutes. So if you feel like we're still in the introduction, you're fine, but I'm not going to hold you that long. All right. I got kids in the back who were acting crazy. So Jesus is walking in, the, in Solomon's colonnade on the outside of the temple, all right? What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make this real for us. We take the Bible and we put it in a special place where things don't really happen. We put it in some sort of abstract world that doesn't have time, space, and matter. We don't think that we can actually go today on an airplane and walk the exact places where Jesus physically walked during a physical time that he was there, an exact place, experience the same temperature, be in the same river, the same sea, the same buildings that he was in. This is a physical person in a place in physical time. Okay? So we need to get, we need to get our brains around that. This isn't a flannel graph, right? When you were in Sunday school. I don't think they do those anymore. I'm dating myself a little bit. When you had the little Moses in his dress and his turban, and then you had the little Jesus, and they would talk to each other, right? The little 50, 50 sheep, you know, flannel graph sheep. Uh, this is a real place where the real person who physically breathed the same air that we breathe, drank the same water that we drink, okay, saw the, some of the same sights that we see. So he's physically walking in a place that still exists. They tore down the temple in 70 AD when, they, when, they, uh, when Rome sacked it because they, again, the Jews got pretty froggy about them being there, rose up, um, got destroyed. And so they destroyed the temple. But the same general area, okay? A somewhat... Newly renovated temple. Jesus is walking in it in Solomon's porch. And while he's walking, he's ambushed by a group of Jewish leaders, a bunch of Pharisees. Now, Pharisee now has a very negative connotation because of the Bible, right? They're, you kill Jesus and all of a sudden people don't like you anymore, right? Pharisees were the religious leaders of the day. 
They were the creme de la creme. If you had an answer, or you, had, you needed an answer from the Bible, Pharisees had it. They were in charge of making sure all God's people were living according to God's law. Because of this, they started adding their own rules onto the Old Testament laws. There were, there were laws that they lived on based on Moses, right? You guys remember Moses? Again, the Red Sea, um, crossing the Red Sea. Moses wrote down laws from God, and the, the Jewish leaders were so afraid that the, Jew, that the Jews were going to break the rules, they started kind of fencing the, the rules with their own rules. So they were afraid that they were going to break the Sabbath, so they said, okay, no healing on the Sabbath. I'm not sure why they had to make that rule. I don't feel like that was happening too much, but either way. So they started making their own rules to protect protect the law because they thought they had to be holy enough for God to come. They thought that once they got to a place of holiness, then Messiah would show up, right? That's why Pharisees are always flipping out in the New Testament when people are, when Jesus is healing on the Sabbath, he's, you know, he's hanging out with sinners. You don't hang out with sinners. Why? Because then you become a sinner, they pollute you, and then God doesn't come. Messiah doesn't come, right? So stay clean, keep your head in the game, do the best you can, right? Let's keep Israel clean um, so that Messiah will come. That's what, the, that's, that's what the expectation was. Everybody still with me? Okay, we're in like fifth gear right now. So. so anyway, they're upset because he's going around healing people. In the previous chapter, he met a blind man. It was the Sabbath, okay? Jesus had compassion for him. He spits on the ground, makes some mud. Weird way to do it, honestly. But he spits on the ground, makes some mud, puts it on his eyes. Don't try this with other people. They get really upset about it. That's what my dad told me. All right? So if you start spitting on people, rubbing stuff in their face, and they don't even know what's happening, all right? They get very, it's very alarming. So Jesus makes mud, puts it on his eyes. He said, go to the pool of Siloam and wash, and you'll be cleansed. So the guy, all right, so he goes, whatever. So he goes, cleanses it. He can see now. He was born blind. Pharisees getting a real tizzy about it. I think that's a biblical word. All right, they're getting a real tizzy, hissy fit throwing, right? They're furious because Jesus healed someone on the Sabbath. They weren't happy that a man who was born blind can now see and some dude who was a construction worker just did it, right? They're saying, it's the Sabbath, man. Come on, what did we tell you about healing people on the Sabbath? What did we tell you about changing people's lives forever for the better on the Sabbath? Get with it, Jesus. So they get upset and the blind man's like, dude, I don't know anything. I don't know, like... He healed me, I can see now, and they're like, you're lying. He's like, well, I don't really know what to do because I can see now when I couldn't before. So they bring his parents in and they're like, hey, this isn't your son, right? And they're like, yeah, it's totally our son. So, and this is, I'm going verbatim here. This is what they said. They had a lot of dudes in literally back then. And so the Pharisees are furious. So they go and argue with Jesus, right? And he basically tells them, you're blind, but you're choosing to be blind. You're rejecting the Messiah, the Messiah you're expecting. He's not... He's not the kind of guy you were expecting to come, and so you're pretty upset about that, and you're shunning him and you're rejecting him. Keep in mind, they want someone to come who's a king to destroy Rome, do some cool guy stuff, some cool army stuff, get rid of Rome, and then allow them to be free and have their own existence in their land, right? They're still expecting that. This is, the Jews are still expecting that, many of them. I mean, there's Messianic Jews and there are Jews who, who believe Jesus was the Messiah and some who don't, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot of um, diversity there. So I'm, I don't want to label everyone under the same umbrella. But there are many who are still waiting for the Messiah to come, even though they murdered him 2,000 years ago, okay? So they're super upset with Jesus. He just healed a blind man on the Sabbath and they're getting a little nervous. So... Jesus is walking. They surround him. The Bible says they were round about him. So they come out, secret ninja style, secret squirrel. They surround him, and they start basically attacking him. And they're saying, just tell us that their exact phrase was, um, let's see, where are, we, where are we at here? They said, tell us plainly, um, how long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. And this is, I'm going to give you a little bit of Bible in 3D here. So you guys know what an idiom is, right? When you have a, a phrase in one language that it doesn't mean, like it's more than the sum of its parts, right? So if you're new somewhere, they say you're still wet behind the ears. You're still green, right? Or you're still new or something along those lines. It doesn't, if you're getting old, they say you're getting long in the tooth. Anyone ever heard that? It has nothing to do with your teeth. Well, it may have something to do with your teeth, but right? It doesn't, if you say that, if you translate that in another language, 
you don't literally say you're getting long in the tooth. If you want that culture to understand, you say, this guy's getting pretty old, right? So you would, you try to keep the same idea. So that's what's happening here. The original, so the original phrase in Hebrew says something like, how long will you take our life? Which is a super weird way to say that in the original, sorry, in the original Greek. Um, how long will you take our life? So that's what they say to him, which is interesting considering they're in the temple. He's about to give his life. But the idea is, dude, you're really getting on our nerves. So if I could translate it into modern English, how long will you take our life means you're killing me, Smalls. You're literally killing me. Tell what? Just be direct, right? Be direct. They want him to say it, and Jesus doesn't give them the answer they want. He says, I already told you, you don't like the answer, and I perform miracles. They're like, wh he said, which miracle are you getting so upset about? And they said, well, it's not the miracle, it's the fact that you are claiming to be God. They clearly understood this because they started picking up rocks, right? They're getting froggy about this. So they start getting rocks, and they're like, all right, we're going to kill this guy right here in, in you know, Solomon's, Solomon's colonnade. Um, outside of the Jerusalem temple. And he says, okay, so which one of these miracles are you killing me for? Just so, I'm, just so we're on the same page. Before you start tossing boulders my way, which miracle are you upset about that I performed? And they are, they're said, no, you, it's because you claim to be God. And he does some wordplay with them and embarrasses them yet again. Um, I always love those parts in the Bible. I'm a little nerdy. I kind of laugh at the, the dialogue um, sometimes. I don't have a lot of friends. It's fine. But again, there's the expectation of the Messiah, of what they were expecting to happen. Jesus shows up and is very different than what they were expecting. And so they were a little confused. They were concerned that if Jesus started mouthing off about being the Messiah, Rome could hear and Rome could come down and crush that. Because you start walking around Jerusalem in, in 20 something AD saying you're a king, there's some Roman kings and rulers who probably have a little bit to say about that, right? Because they're always expecting a revolt. Rome wasn't always known for being super nice. I don't know if you guys know that. Sometimes they did uh, pretty mean stuff. So what they were expecting was the hammer of Judas Maccabeus, and what they got was the lamb of God. So they were expecting a fight, and they got a sacrifice instead. They weren't prepared for that. They weren't ready for that. And what's infuriating for them is that they couldn't refute it because he had healed so many people. And he hadn't done this yet, but he raises Lazarus from the dead and Jairus' daughter. He finds this man who's born blind and heals him along with several others. He cleanses lepers. I mean, he does stuff across the board. Everywhere he goes, he's just healing people left and right. They don't know what to do with this information because he's not what they were expecting, but they keep telling him, if you read the dialogues that, he, that the Pharisees have with Jesus, they say, even Nicodemus in John chapter three, a few chapters back, he says, no one can do these things except he come from God. Right. They said, we, we, don't, we don't know what you are or who you are or what's going on here, but we do know no one can do this unless it comes from God. In fact, the Pharisees argued with each other because when Jesus left, after Jesus healed the blind man, right? Jesus smoked him in a debate, as he always does, dropped mic, walked away. They start arguing, right? They're saying, some of the Pharisees are saying, this can't be Messiah. He was born here. He's breaking the Sabbath, right? He's not, he, he's not what we expect. And the others are saying, no way, look at all the stuff he's doing. And they say, well, maybe he has a demon. And they're like, dude, demons aren't casting out other demons. They're not healing people. They're not healed. Like, no way, this can't be. So they're just going at it, right? Because they don't know what to do with him. They don't know what to, where to place him. And just as a heads up, if you're living for God, I don't mean just coming to church and calling yourself a Christian. If you're truly living for God, you're gonna bust some categories, okay? People aren't gonna know where to place you because they're gonna call themselves Christians too. And when you don't do the things that they're doing, they're gonna get a little upset about that, right? Amen. And when you don't talk the way that they talk or drink what they drink or pick up some of the habits that they have, right? You're not gonna fit in those categories, Amen. okay? When Jesus left, he told his disciples, they are gonna hate you. 
but it's not because of your personality. It's not because you're Enneagram or any of your cultural background, right? It's not because of your psyche, maybe because of your bad jokes, but they said they're gonna hate you because they hate me. And right. you look like me right. and you talk like me and you act like me, right? That's why they called them Christians. Right. They called them Christians first where? Was it Antioch? Where they called them Christians because it means little Christ. Amen. Okay, so if you live for God, as a, as a side, if you live for God, truly live for God, you will not fit into the same categories, even if they're religious ones, okay? You're gonna upset people. I heard someone say, if you're a friend to all, you're a friend to none, right? My grandma had a magnet on her fridge, um, my dad's mom, that said, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. So, just something to keep in mind. Um, we want to be compassionate. We want to be flexible with people in so much as we can. But there are things that should be deal breakers for us as believers with the people we hang out with, with yeah. the places we go, with the, with the things that we do and how we behave. So he's walking. And what's happening here, the symbolism is just, it's insane, right? Jesus, God in the flesh, is walking in the temple. He, he had already said when he cleansed the temple earlier in the book of John, he said, you know, I'm going to, all of this is going to be replaced by me. I'm going to, I'm going to destroy it. And in three days, I'm going to build a new temple. He was talking about his body. Amen. So the new temple, the person, the Messiah, the God in the flesh character who is replacing temple worship, who is replacing the sacrifices, who is replacing this idea that, that God is only in Jerusalem in the temple, Right? That person is walking in that temple at that time, and the most austere followers are rejecting him. They don't want to have anything to do with him. John, the first book of John, um, John chapter 1, is basically just a prologue to the book of John. And John is writing about um, how we are to receive Jesus. And he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. He's saying, Jesus, this person, is God in the flesh. So you, as a Christian, you can't read John chapter 1 and walk away saying, I wonder if Jesus is actually deity or he's, little, he's mixing some words here. No, he's God in the flesh yeah. or he's a liar. Yeah. So those are the only options we have when we read the New Testament, okay? So John 1, 14 says, and the word, so he calls Jesus the word. He says he was with, he was in the beginning before creation. He was, well, it can't be before creation because that's before time. He's outside of time. Okay, I don't, I don't want to go philosophical. Your, your brains are going to explode because we've been going for 30 minutes. But when nothing existed, Jesus existed. Amen. Okay, can we put it like that? Amen. When nothing was created, the creator was there, and that was Jesus, and he is God. Right. John 1.14 says, The word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's what incarnate means, in carne. So in Latin, incarne, in the flesh. Okay? We're fancy now. We're using Latin. Greek, and I inadvertently said Hebrew, so we're crushing all the languages right now. So we're super fancy today. So the person who represented the spiritual and physical renewal that Israel needed was walking through the colonnade at that time. In shoe leather, hopefully, he wasn't barefoot, all right? I've seen some of those college students, all right? I'm hoping he's wearing shoes. But he's walking through the temple. He is God in the flesh. He's fulfilling prophecies all over the place, right? And he is the, the renewal. He's not the hammer. He's the lamb, so they weren't ready for that. And they reject him. So John 1, 14 says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And John says, we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So my hope is that when you read this passage again specifically, and when you read the New Testament, you bring some of this, and I threw a lot at you, okay? You bring some of this idea with you. So when you find Jesus arguing with Pharisees, okay? And you're saying, why are they so upset about this? Bring in some of this context, right. and it makes a lot more sense when you find people trying to stone Jesus for making a few harmless statements, okay? So this is the backdrop, this is the background, okay? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Help us to absorb this truth. And we pray that we will honor you with our lives in Jesus' name. Amen.